So, are we ready? Do we need a break for the video? No? Good? Okay. All right, so um, when we look at predicting reading in English, all those things I asked you to do, banana without the ba, that syllable deletion, um, detecting a tone. So is ma the same as ma? Yes or no? Is ma the same as ma? No! Okay, so it's easy for, some of them is, are easy for you and some of them are very hard. Okay, and we, I, if I start putting it into two or three syllable words and I ask you the middle syllable, I can kill you all. Okay, so it's not that easy. And um, so there are some processing, some features about sound that English speakers not only are they not good at, but it also doesn't predict reading. So it's not just about sound or even linguistic sounds per se. It's really about syllables and the syllable onset. So <clears throat> say spot without the s, pot, right? So these are the things that predict reading in English as well as speeded naming if I give you a whole page of different pictures and ask you to say what they are, okay? Um, what do you think is going to predict reading in Cantonese? Tone detection. Sorry? Tone detection. Tone detection. Anything else? Yes? Okay. I mean, these are really our control variables. Um, they didn't predict, but maybe. Okay. So you think because it's characters. Okay. Anything else? Well, let's find out. Sorry for the ravens. Almost, though. Okay. Um, speeded naming, being able to name the pictures. That is, some, by some people, considered to be a measure of phonological awareness. Syllable deletion. Tan, xia, ling. Say my name without the xia. Can anybody do it? Tan, ling. My name. So if you say my name without the xia or without the tan. So that predicts reading in Cantonese, as does tone detection. Look at the difference between tone detection, though, and Raven's matrices. This is even after Raven's matrices are controlled for. Okay? So it's not about the visual aspects per se. These sound aspects matter as well for Cantonese. But it's not the same. So notice that the syllable onset, the spot, actually has no predictability. All right, so syllables and tones matter for Cantonese. All right, so now somebody was asking about bilinguals. We're now in bilingual territory. Here is looking at predicting English reading. So this is the question. Does learning to read in Russian or learning to read in English, so learning to read in Russian, does that affect how you read English? Our answer is yes, at least for Chinese. I would predict it would also matter for Russian. Um, and I would love to do something on like the Miyaki's nut because it's like such an interesting um, phenomenon and, and like where the stress, that would be a really interesting study to do. Okay, so monolingual English speakers, whoops. Monolingual English speakers, notice this typical thing, we tested their morphological awareness, not significant. Okay, and we found things. Phonological awareness, highly predictive, and vocabulary, highly predictive. Um, morphological awareness, however, is highly related to vocabulary, whereas phonological awareness in this sample of slightly older children is not. What about Chinese-English bilinguals? Remember, reading in English. So all we're asking them to do is read the word car. Here we find that morphological awareness also doesn't matter. Phonological awareness is a little bit more strongly related. And this phonological awareness pattern, though, is not significant. Okay, so we don't have all of a sudden morphological awareness taking over. But it's not 
the same as in English speakers. Well, how does this affect the brain? Now we talk about fMRI and fNIRs. So this is fNIRs, so it's infrared light um, and optodes. All right, so what we find, remember that STG? Oh, I didn't say STG, I had SFG. Okay, so we got an STG here, IFG we had in that other um, study. So this is what it looks like for an English speaker um, when they are actively processing print. Okay, when they're reading and recognizing a word. Is this a word in English? Yes, no. This, these are the areas that are active. What we find in English dyslexics is that this area is less active. So what do you think happens for Chinese typical readers? What areas are going to be active? Somebody want? Temporal gyrus. Temporal gyrus? Superior to, so you think this is going to be active? For Chinese? Yeah. I think in comparison to frontal gyrus, I think frontal maybe. This one? Uh, yeah. Why? Coordination? So, sorry, because uh, this error is active in uh, writing. And the person is uh, writing. Okay. And because uh, things. So. And so nothing here, you think, or less active here? Less. less. Because? Because uh, um, the hearing in Chinese is not uh, very necessary. Well, we, we showed just before that it matters, but it's different things that predict it. Okay. Any other areas that w would be active? Remember that first graph, those three areas that I told you to remember? There was one that showed up. Medial frontal gyrus. Okay, that was active in the processing of English speakers doing that typicality judgment, but not Chinese speakers. So, correct on IFG, correct on um, superior temporal gyrus, however, this other area is also active. It has something to do with category processing and processing of um, semantics, uh, but not in that same way of just recognizing it. Okay, so we look to predict reading in English and Chinese. Now I'm talking about Mandarin, not Cantonese. This is a second study, monolingual English speakers, bilingual English speakers, bilingual Chinese speakers. Phonological awareness, or I'm sorry, bilingual speakers of English and Chinese reading Chinese, bilingual speakers of um, English and Chinese reading English. What do you see here? What's similar? So monolingual speakers reading English, their native language, and bilingual Chinese speakers reading Chinese, but growing up in the United States with English surrounding them, are not showing the typical effect for Chinese monolinguals reading Chinese. So again, bilinguals are weird. Okay, that's the takeaway. Is bilinguals are transferring their skills back and forth. So we saw a one-way transfer with um, the morphological awareness not being as important earlier, but now we're seeing phonological awareness as being important in reading Chinese, which it typically is not. So, we wanted to look more carefully at this. Um, these are typical Chinese readers, adults, main areas of activation. What we found um, with our sample of English monolingual children, ages um, six or seven until 12, 
um, is that these kids showed the typical um, areas of activation as adults do and a little more, which makes sense because children are just, they, there's just a lot more activity. Uh oh. Okay. Um, here at bilingual English, so by English, Chinese, reading in English, you see this same pattern, but you're not showing as much of that interaction, and I'm not sure why. And here they are reading in Chinese. And again, this is, oh, I'm sorry, that's, this is not reading. This is the morphological awareness task. Ah, okay, that explains it. All right, so when Chinese participants are reading, or are doing the morphological awareness task, we see differences, and the English kids, this is a much less familiar task for them. So when Chinese kids are processing English morphological awareness tasks, here you have Chinese transferring over. However, these are very small numbers. So we wanted to replicate. We have an ongoing study. Um, I want to point out that Yulia Kovelman um, is from Moscow, grew up here, um, and is uh, the PI on this grant um, and is responsible for most of the brain stuff. I have been tasked with the torturous task of coming up with stimuli. Um, and so what we did is we now came up with tasks for three languages, English, Chinese, and Spanish. We have Chinese bilinguals and Spanish bilinguals, both growing up in the US. And we have both compound and derivational morphology. Our previous study, it could have been because English doesn't have so many of those things like chu that you heard. We have basketball, we have paper, we have ball, we have paper, but we don't have as many. Um, English instead has all of these derivational compounds like disagree, rerun, et cetera, et cetera. So Spanish um, has both, um, and Chinese has many more of these, so it was hard to come up with these, but we did. And so what we now have is two different kinds of morphology tasks, and the results are, surprisingly, um, first of all, if we look at, okay, so just one other orientation. This is FMIRS data, not fMRI. So high difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated is going to show up as a dark color. Um, it could be negative or it could be positive. Okay, so fMRI, fMRI you're only looking um, at the deoxygenation and you just see one type of activation. Okay, so here, what we, so if it's dark blue or dark red, that's lots of activation, okay? And a big difference, so this is total um, uh, hemoglobin, not oxy or deoxy. Okay, so what we find is that English, so heritage language speakers, even though these kids are growing up in the United States and have spent more time in an English dominant environment, these kids are processing English using more resources in that morphological awareness task than they are um, in their native language. And even in the control task, where all they're asked is, is it the same word? They're doing, engaging in more processing in their non-native language, English, than in their native language, okay? Here, it's the morphology task, and what we find here is that Chinese bilinguals, if we look at the compound morphology, we see a little bit of activation in that same IFG area, but not a lot more. And in the derivational morphology, which is a different kind of task for Chinese, we, there are not as many derivational compounds in Chinese. They're actually engaging in more processing. So dark blue, dark red, we're gonna kind of, English speakers um, are engaging also in the derivational and in the compound and look at, they're actually in very similar areas, but then you have this STG area as well. This um, FNIRS technology does not have as fine resolution, 
So you see bigger blobs. Okay, that doesn't mean that the activation is across this whole area. It just means that that's what we're able to measure because the um, optodes and the receptors are about one and a half to two centimeters apart. Okay. So, um, and then for the bilingual Spanish speakers, which has large numbers of both, um, what you see is still activation, but you see more of this kind of activation and a little bit of this frontal area, um, but not this additional um, processing going on. Okay, so that is the end of the brain stuff. And the final thing is, um, is technology going to destroy us? Because there are actually much less research on it. Um, it's a growing area of research. Those of any of you are students and you're thinking, oh, what's a good topic? This is an amazing topic um, for a lot of reasons. Number one, because um, many people are reading um, on, in electronic forms. All right, so here's a surprising finding. Actually, before I tell you this surprising finding, I'm going to ask you what you think. Um, so, who likes to read ebooks? Do your parents like to read ebooks? Who prefers a paper book? Do you know what your parents prefer? <clears throat> paper book? Okay. <clears throat> so, who reads faster on ebooks? Or I'm not going to say reads faster. I'm going to say whose difference in reading speed is greater? Ebook for ebooks versus paper books. You or your parents? Hmm. Your parents? So you think they're slower, much slower for ebooks, or much faster for ebooks? No difference. No difference for younger people, no difference for older people. Habit, okay. Um, what about um, comprehension? Do you think there is any difference in comprehension for you guys? You think yes? Not expect it? What I if, think yes. You I think, think yes? My comprehension is much better than for my children or my grandchildren. Okay, so older people's comprehension is better than younger. Do you think for you, reading on an e-book versus a paper book, the comprehension is different? Uh, it's a different kind of reading. Actually, fiction, I usually read on a paper book, mm -hmm. and I read it slowly because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read an e-book, usually it's for being informed. Mm -hmm. And then my speed of reading is much faster. What about you guys? You read fiction too fast? I think for me there is a big difference between reading an e-book with this little line that shows the progress and without it. With this little line it is almost the same as a normal book, a paper book. And without it it is a bit confusing because each time I have to think where I am Okay, so I will tell you a little bit of research, but your hypotheses are wonderful places to start for further research. Um, so here is what I was able to find. I was asked to address this question to a bunch of booksellers, and what do you think they wanted to hear? Paper's better, Paper's better right? Um, so, comprehension. No difference between ebook and paper book for younger adults. Also, no difference between paper book and ebook reading same kind of material for older adults. I did not check whether older adults' comprehension was better than younger adults, and I will. Um, second, Reading speed for younger adults when reading paper books is much faster 
than older adults reading paper books. Reading speed for younger adults is the same when reading paper books versus ebooks, controlling for the actual material. Okay? Reading speed for older adults was faster for ebooks than for paper books. That shocked me. And then I started to think about it. You can actually make the contrast bigger. You can um, change the font size. And as my eyes are starting to get worse for close things, I mean, I hate reading on my computer. Like if students give me papers, I have to print it out and write all over it because I can correct it online if it's a little bit, but if it's a lot or something, I just, I, I need to see it because I, I just need it. Um, but it also makes my eyes tired. But if you read on an ebook and you can manipulate things like the color, the contrast, um, you can get rid of blue light glare. Supposedly, my new glasses do that. Um, it's interesting. So, actually, older adults in this study, so again, um, did much better when um, reading ebooks than reading paper books in terms of speed. Okay, but comprehension, no difference. All right? Preferences. The older adults in this study showed less of a preference for paper books than the younger adults. The younger adults overwhelmingly preferred paper books. Okay. Uh, children, however, are different. So children uh, below third grade, typically, and there are a lot of different studies, there are slightly different findings, but overall, children reading ebooks comprehend less than when they're reading paper books. Also, parents, when they read with their children, talk less when they are reading ebooks than when they are reading paper books. And the talk that they have is much more about flipping pages or how to do something in an ebook. The one difference, there are two differences. When children are reading ebooks and they are ebooks that are facilitated with definitions, children are much more likely to look up words that they can just touch and their comprehension is improved when reading those kinds of ebooks. So they have to be interactive in some way. Um, and the same factors that matter for children um, when they're reading together, when they're reading paper books, also matter when they're reading ebooks. So parents reading the ebook together with their child has a much stronger impact on the children's reading skills. Okay, so unfortunately, a lot of parents just give their child the device, and the device cannot take the place of a parent. All right, so that's the um, last thing I want to say, and I assume there are some questions. Um, yeah. Do you want me to try and get out of this, too? Oops. My idea for the uh, enhanced speed of uh, reading for adults and for yeah, for older adults and for younger adults of ebooks compared to paper books is just uh, electronic reading serves social function for both older and young adults. And But why would the difference be greater for older adults than for younger adults? So actually, younger adults don't show a difference in reading speed. It's only the older adults. <laughs> You're silent. <laughs> Thinking. It's, it's, 
It's interesting. It's a really interesting question. Um, yeah. yeah. You, you can probably discuss it after mm -hmm. the drink lunch. So there are yeah, other so questions? Yeah, I'm cool, questions. thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have two options now. So we, we go for the questions and do just that. But if you still will have any questions, don't hesitate. I will create a special form on the website and you can uh, uh, leave your question there. And uh, I'll ask you to answer them in like a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, in yeah. The video, if there will be any other questions. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let's just. Uh, go I can type the answers. No, you want a video answer? Yeah, yeah we, I'll type it out oh, for its generation Z. Ah, okay. So YouTube works much more than that. Okay. So these are just the uh, Luddites in the room, is that what you're saying? Uh, is that what you're calling them? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> you know what the word Luddite means? Yeah, but I'm not this one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So uh, here are the questions. If there are some uh, big questions, then we can skip them and then they will be answered later. Wow. Um, I would never say they are dumb forever. I would say that um, reading changes, changes the brain um, and it changes what you're exposed to. So, you know, and people learn to read in adulthood as well. And there are people who, um, you know, learn languages later. Um, Joseph Conrad is a famous example, don't know if it's true or urban myth. He didn't learn English until he was in his late 20s and he wrote these novels in English that were amazing. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of people who learn to read not, and this was more true 50 years ago than it is now. And I don't know that the same changes didn't happen for them as for younger children. Um, I think if you don't have access to print and you don't have access to um, the ability to learn how to read, I think it does lead to different ways of relying on information or different senses around you. But I think it would be very, very difficult to do that study right now. 50 years ago or 70 years ago, I think it wouldn't have been so difficult. Okay, next. Uh, so given that reading allows to revive, <laughs> can we read uh -oh. uh, habits come at the expense of listening to others? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes. Yeah, uh, let's discuss it later, okay? Later? Okay. Because we have been Language is different between each other from the point of view of combining parts into the whole world. I think it refers to what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Do you think grades and ways of perception also differs, differ between different nationalities? There are studies. Um, there's a lot of studies on Japanese um, versus um, Anglo-Americans, and there are also some studies on Anglo-Americans versus Asian, quote, Asian Americans, which is a very weird category. Um, and what the suggestion is, is that Japanese people, when they look at a scene, process it more holistically. Um, I tried to do something like that. My study failed completely um, in that I was looking at what people remembered from a picture and I got the same results across English and Chinese participants, but I think with eye tracking it would be really interesting um, to look at that. Uh, but you would have to have a more specific um, hypothesis about it to really kind of think about what is going to differ. Is that it? Well, do you think it's reasonable to connect people with different native language, background, in order to make creative, uh, creative teams? 
Sure. As long as they can communicate with each other somehow. Yeah, I think that, I mean, creative teams come from synergies, not from everybody being the same, right? And when you get people that are the same, you end up with a lot of groupthink. So whether it's different languages, different backgrounds, etc. But I've been a part of many interdisciplinary teams, and it can be very challenging because we all have our biases. So in order to really be creative, you've got to either have a sense of humor or put the biases on the table and cover them up um, and let go while you're working together because it's not going to be helpful. Or if you know that point of view and way of structuring the world is helpful, but the bias and the negative perceptions is not, and I think that's true in any uh, interactions. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, there's a lot. Uh, in fact, there's a huge, um, if you're not familiar with this, there's a website on NIH, and it's called a, can't remember what, if you type in brain mapping and NIH, there's a huge database of MRI for people of different ages, and a lot of people who do um, like MEG work or ERP work, sometimes FNIRS, FNIRS, we try not to, uh, because it's just wobbier, but um, so there's MRI data, but there's also a lot of well-established reasons for fMRI data. So, and a lot of MRI studies now usually do an anatomical scan first as part of it. So what, what can you probably find that, 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 I think it was your question. No, but if somebody knows how to do it and wants to collaborate, I would love to. So eye tracking, I think, is really interesting, especially for kids and when somebody is actually learning. So to answer the question about processing differently, um, I want to know where people are looking, for instance, when they're learning something from a video. So if I have videos, the last screen was, uh, I have videos for teaching English to young children. And when I say a target word, if I say ball, I want to know if the kid's looking at ball or how long it takes for them to figure out without translations where to look. Because if you repeat it different times and you have that ball showing up over and over again, do they go to it right away? Probably if they knew the word before watching the video. But if they didn't know the word, where do they look? And how long does it take them to figure out what it is? <laughs> well, do we become more stupid when we read from the screen? Does reading from smartphone influence the spoken language or not? I just noticed this. So, um. So has anyone noticed that when you read from the screen on the smartphone, you uh, become more, so less fluent in the spoken language? Like you can formulate your know, phrases? I had somebody tell me that she's noticing in university students right now, her students, that they're not as good at writing and some of them like can't actually write cursive. They're very good at typing and they can write block letters, but their cursive is terrible. No, I think you become different. I mean, it's, I don't want to put value judgments on things, and I think that. You're just too polite. <laughs> no, I think that we need to accept that technology is here, embrace it for what it's good at, and think about like how to use it wisely. So I wouldn't want to um, not allow children screens, but I don't want to give one-year-old screens. 
I think that one-year-olds need to see the world. I mean, even two and three-year-olds. They need to you know, touch things and play with things much more than they need to look at a screen. No. I think those are just the beginning. Oh, what do I think about audiobooks? Huh. Um, I love listening to them. So I like to walk, and I walk to work almost every day. Um, and it's about 40 minutes each way for me to walk, and I am often listening to audiobooks. Um, I think that they're useful in that they have more complex language than a talk show. Often a podcast is very conversational, whereas an audiobook actually has more complex language in it. Um, if you're asking, do I think audiobooks should replace text? I would say no, because I can read about three times as fast as the audiobook, especially if the audiobook is being, you know, if, if they're just talking really fast and they're just saying a bunch of stuff and blah, 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 or you speed it up, I mean, you're not really listening and enjoying it. Um, but I can read much faster than an audiobook. Um, yeah. Uh, well, this was the last question from Kiev. Uh, let's thank uh, Professor Daniel for.